Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Thomistic Institute. Tonight, we have the privilege of welcoming a distinguished and, for many of us, familiar guest, Father Gregory Pine, an assistant director of the Thomistic Institute. Father Gregory will be giving us a lecture titled, He Lived Our Life, The Mysteries of Christ in the Story of Salvation. We are currently learning about Christology in the Aquinas group, so Father Gregory's talk is a huge help in advancing our plan of study for this term. Father Gregory is an instructor of dogmatic and moral theology at the Dominican House of Studies. He completed his doctorate in dogmatic theology at the University of Freiburg, Switzerland. And Father Gregory received his BA from the Franciscan University of Steubenville, his Bachelor of Sacred Theology, Master of Divinity, and Licentiate in Sacred Theology from the Pontifical Faculty of the Immaculate Conception at the Dominican House of Studies. Father Gregory has published articles in Angelicum, Nova et Vetera, and The Thomist. He is the co-author of Credo, an RCIA programme, and Marian Consecration with Aquinas, as well as the author of Prudence, Choose Confidently, Live Boldly. His writing also appears in Ascension's Catholic Classic series, in Alatea, and in Magnificat. He is a regular contributor, as many of us know, to the podcasts Pints with Aquinas, Catholic Classics, the Thomistic Institute, and Godsplaining. Now, without further ado, I invite you to show your appreciation and welcome Father Gregory for his talk, He Lived Our Life, The Mysteries of Christ and the Story of Salvation. Thank you very much, and thanks for your presence here, for your attendance, uh, for your generosity. Um, it's a delight to be here. I've never been in Oxford before, and um, I don't know what I had imagined previous to coming, uh, but certainly my experience has been, yeah, charming, winsome, delightful, and very grateful to the friars here who have hosted me so generously. So I suppose the question with which we begin, as the title is proposed, is why exactly did Christ live a human life as he did? Obviously, or perhaps not obviously, but obviously for our purposes, he didn't need to. Uh, God could have saved us in any way he thought fit to save us. And it needn't have been through the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ or through the mysteries that he performed and suffered. But I think specifically the question of why a whole human life, why a human life lived to this degree or extent, why a whole human life lived to its term. And I think one way uh, in which to, to complicate the question so as to uncomplicate the question is to consider it first from the vantage of merit. So perhaps you've come across this notion of merit before. Um, in the older translation of the Novus Ordo, prior to 2010, we had very few mentions of merit. And then with the new translation, that's one word that appears in the presidential prayer, so the collect, the secret, and the post-communion with much greater frequency. So it's something about which we speak in the context of the liturgy. In St. Thomas's understanding, merit names an arrangement whereby God preordains that if one performs an act in a state of grace, with charity, with love, that that act yields a certain reward. So God gives the gift of grace, he gives the activity of the individual, and he gives the reward, but he also gives the arrangement whereby the merit yields the reward, if that makes sense. So God gives X, and he gives Y, and he gives that X makes Y, or that X yields Y. It's very thick, causally. Now, when we look at the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we see that there is no charity beyond the Lord's charity. We can speak of his charity as a quasi-infinite charity. And that quasi-infinite charity is at work throughout the whole of his life. So, from his earliest moments, our Lord merits with a quasi-infinite charity. And so it would follow that he merits a quasi-infinite reward. In plain speak, our Lord merits our salvation from the moment of his conception, which sounds perhaps fantastical, but certainly overwhelming. It's generous beyond compare. But then you might ask the question further, why continue? Why go beyond conception if in a certain sense you have already paid the price? Why heap infinity upon infinity upon infinity? For a certain vantage, it, it looks excessive, or repetitive, or even foolish, certainly prodigal. So then, 
This prompts us to look more closely at what's afoot, at what it is that our Lord Jesus Christ is doing in his flesh. Because if it's a commercial transaction, and if he came simply to pay the price, then he is overpaid and overpaid and overpaid and overpaid. So then let's consider it from the vantage of what I'll just call his coordinated causality. Um, and I'm thinking here especially of our Lord's efficient causality, his exemplar causality, and his final causality. So efficient causality would just be like agent causality. So when we think about the famous example of Aristotle and the making of a bronze statue, here we're talking about the sculptor. We're talking about the one who realizes the effect. When it comes to exemplar causality, we're thinking about the notion which exists in the mind of the sculptor, which he then impresses in the matter. So it's like formal causality, but it's extrinsic, whereas formal causality is intrinsic. And then final causality, that for which, or that for the sake of which. So again, in the case of this statue here, we're talking about the beautification of the space, or the exaltation of the hero, or whatever else, the end sought by the community who commissioned the statue and by the artisan himself, the sculptor. When St. Thomas describes God's causality, specifically his causality vis-a-vis -vis creation, and here you can think of Prima Par's question 44, he describes it in precisely these terms. Okay, so efficient causality, exemplar causality, and final causality. And earlier on in the Summa, we've ruled out other options. So it's not going to be material causality, because God is not the stuff out of which, nor is it going to be formal causality of an intrinsic sort, because we've ruled out that God is a kind of world soul. St. Augustine helped us with that already. So then I want to propose Christ as cause of salvation from this vantage, holding these causes together, not leaning on one and away from the others, or insisting on one so as to exclude the others, but holding them together. And we'll just progress through them. So the first being efficient, the second being exemplar, and the third being final. And they get shorter. <laughs> so we'll gather speed. Uh, so first, let's talk a little bit about the efficient causality. Whenever we talk about efficient causality, maybe not whenever we talk about it, but often enough when we talk about efficient causality, we'll distinguish between principal efficient causes and instrumental efficient causes. So like for instance... Uh, if I had a whiteboard, which I do over here, I could use um, a dry erase marker and write on that whiteboard and deploy that dry erase marker as my instrument. So I being the principal cause who is intelligent or who is rational and who makes rational marks on the board so as to communicate. So you can see a kind of neat causal picture. And I use that dry erase marker as part of the process as an instrument. And the dry erase marker, it leaves its mark, quite literally, on the process. So that it's this thick, the letters that is, so that the letters are this thick, or that they are this color, or that they kind of show this kind of stroke or texture, is a fruit of the instrument that I've adopted. So when you look, when you look at the kind of coordinated causal picture, there's a sense in which my causality flows through the instrument, and the instrument is ennobled by that is dignified by that, and it comes to partake in my causality, and it, it shares in my causality. So, um, yeah, I mean, left to its own devices, a red dry erase marker will not amount to much. It just takes up space. But in the hand of an intelligent agent, it can be part of the communication of sacred theology, right? It can actually share in a, a term, it can share in a causal work far beyond the bounds, which are kind of prescribed by its nature. So then, when we talk about that instrument, we see in it a kind of proper operation. And these are the terms that St. Thomas uses. Its proper operation is to kind of give red ink to whatever surface one applies it to. Uh, sorry about the, the convoluted prepositions there. Its, its proper operation is to give or deliver red ink. And, and it has to have some kind of proper operation or else I wouldn't pick it up. It would have been assumed in vain. If I were just patronizing it or condescending to it and saying like, listen, you can take part in my theology class, right? That'd be foolish. It would actually trip us up. It would pose an obstacle to the communication of sacred truth. And as a result of which, we wouldn't admit it. 
Uh, so it, it has a proper operation. It makes some causal contribution. And then we can speak of it having a participated operation. And this is the sense, the kind of full sense in which it's an instrument, that it participates my causality. It participates my operation and is dignified or exalted by that. And then it shares in my finality, right, with the glory of God and the salvation of souls as shaped by the Dominican charism and my legitimate assignment for the communication of saving truth. So then on this rubric or against this backdrop, we can consider what's going on in the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's afoot? What work is he about? Uh, we can kind of pause at the outset and say there is no instrument quite like this instrument. There is no instrument quite like this instrument. And we'll observe that that has very concrete um, implications for how we understand the contribution of our Lord's sacred humanity and his mysteries in the work of salvation. But um, we can identify, you know, like various instruments on a hierarchy. And so the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ is at the highest point of this hierarchy or it crowns this hierarchy. So we have things like dry erase markers, or like hammers, or like saws, things which are inanimate, right, and which are separate. So things which have no life within them, things which are separate from their principal cause, and are only ever implicated in that work when they're picked up. Otherwise, they kind of lie dormant or dead. So these would be the lowest form of instruments. But then there are other kind of higher instruments, and here we can just kind of um, include various sorts uh, in a broad swath, but like domestic animals, uh, so like dogs and cats, they're a kind, they can be like an instrument insofar as a dog can be trained to take somebody who's seeing impaired through the city without, you know, tripping up or hitting his or her head. Uh, so that, that dog becomes an instrument, as it were, of the rational life of its owner. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the example that Aristotle uses is often slavery. So hearkening back to a time in which, um, but that this individual has his own life, but he's subject to the command of his master, or we could just say servant, perhaps to soften it. Uh, so you have various living things, which still separate from the principal cause, carry out the work of the principal cause by a kind of obedience or by a kind of coercion or violence. Uh, so these would be the next kind of highest tier. In the case of the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have an animate instrument, you have a human nature, and it's conjoined to the principal cause. It's wed to the principal cause. It's assumed by the principal cause. It's hypostatically united to the principal cause. So here we have a high, high instrument, much higher than a saw or a dry erase marker or something like that much higher than a donkey or a mere human being who's just toddling around on the surface of the earth being about his business. We're talking about the most perfect of human natures wed in greatest intimacy to the second of the most blessed trinity. So when we, we set up kind of our description of instrumental causality, and now we're already seeing that maybe that, that notion of instrumental causality, it's it's coming apart in our hands, or we might fear that it's coming apart in our hands. We're not entirely sure how useful it is as a concept because maybe Christ's sacred humanity breaks the rule. Certainly it's, it's a strange instrumentality because it seems to yeah, depart from many of the instrumental models that we'll often use to clarify our examples. Now, with respect to this instrumentality, uh, just uh, one further word before talking about its strangeness. And we, we can see in this sublime and intimate union, a kind of being piece and a kind of doing piece, what I'll call entitative instrumentality and what I'll call operative instrumentality. So the Lord takes up our human nature and establishes in it a kind of static abiding of the divine presence, all right? Which is to say that that human nature is wed to the Godhead. But then he also operates, he also acts, he also performs deeds and sufferings in this human nature. So not only does he take it to himself in a kind of static way, but he also puts it through the paces in a kind of dynamic way. So this instrumentality which we perceive, it's ultimately for that unfolding. It's ultimately for that, that deploying. Okay, so that having been set up, then let's talk a little bit about how this, this is strange. Um, 
So usually uh, with instruments in the natural order, we take them to hand for, for two main reasons. One is to supply for our need. Okay. Uh, so for instance, I will use a dry erase marker and a whiteboard because chalk and the green board or blackboard are not available to me. Uh, that's the only reason for which I would stoop to such depths. Um, no, just kidding. Uh, because if I didn't deploy some kind of instrument, then I would be constantly etching things in wax tablets and then having to erase them in the back of my hand. And very soon, my hands would be desiccated from all of that whatever activity. And then I'd crack at the knuckles and I'd give up my teaching practice. And um, so I use instruments of a certain sort as a way by which to facilitate whatever intelligible marks I mean to make. It's because I need, right? I could just say it out loud, but as my, my students informed me in the first semester, you need to one, slow down, and two, write things. <laughs> to which I responded, yes, gladly, with pleasure. Um, right, so, so I take an instrument to hand to supply for my need because I can't dispose whatever matter immediately in a way that's, that's excellent, in a way that's actually helpful for the auditor. But then we'll often use an instrument as a way by which to establish contact, okay? So like um, an instance being, um, again, we can just use our, our whiteboard and our dry erase marker. Um, I, you know, hold that dry erase marker in just the right way so as to be close to the board and write. But if this dry erase marker were three feet long, I suppose I could write, but it would be very silly for one and also very dicey because I suspect that my penmanship would devolve in direct proportion to the length of my instrument. All right, so like we use instruments so as to establish meaningful contact with whatever we intend to change or whatever medium we intend to impress our you know, rational agency upon. Uh, so it's a way of supplying for my need and a way of establishing contact. Now, let's think about instruments in the supernatural order. All right? And on the one hand, uh, instruments in the supernatural order do not supply for the need of the agent. They don't, because God doesn't need anything or anyone. Sometimes people hear that and it's dispiriting or it's discouraging, but I think it's ultimately liberating. Think about the practical import of that when it comes to discerning your vocation. God gave you a life, and he gave you a vocation because he thought you might like it. He's not in search of bond servants. Okay, so um, it doesn't supply for the need of the agent. Rather, often enough, <coughs> instrumental causes in the supernatural order are meant to accommodate the need of the patient. They're meant to accommodate the need of those to whom this communication, this salvation, is addressed. So God does not require an instrument. He could do everything that he does immediately. That is to say, directly without any mediation. Uh, so here, in this instance, what we find in the supernatural orders, the instrument functions as a kind of specification or a determination of the divine power. It helps to kind of locate for us or it helps to circumscribe for us what it is that God is doing. And you can think here of the species of bread and wine in the celebration of the Eucharistic mystery. So, not to supply for the need of the agents, but to accommodate the need of the patient. Second point, instruments as deployed in the supernatural order don't establish contact, or they're not needed to establish contact because the agent himself needs such contact established. God has immediate spiritual contact with all times and with all places by virtue of the divine eternity, immensity, and omnipresence. So God doesn't need something else to facilitate his contact. As the giver of being, as the giver of agency, God is present to all of us innermostly. Says St. Augustine, he is more present to us than we are to ourselves. And perhaps you've seen that pre-Raphaelite painting of Christ knocking on the door, and the implication is that it's the door of our heart but that door, it has a, a knob on the inside. You know, it can only be opened from within. That is true. But it's, I think, truer to say that it's we who are knocking on the door of our own hearts. It is we who need to be admitted to our heart of hearts by Christ, who abides there as creator and who means to abide there as Lord, that is to say, in grace. And so 
God doesn't need an instrument to establish contact. Rather, he uses instruments as a way to elicit or to adduce a kind of recognition and response on the part of the patient. You'll see the theme emerging. It's not for him. It's for us. So the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ and the mysteries thereof facilitate a kind of intentional or sacramental contact with the Godhead, with God, with God's saving power. So then we can speak of our Lord's sacred humanity and the mysteries of his life as rendering the divine operation in some sense, and these are words used by St. Thomas Aquinas, easier, nearer, and more human. Okay? That is to say, closer to our sensibilities, closer to us after a manner, or at least closer to our recognition, or closer to our recognition and response. So what we see here uh, when it comes to instruments as deployed in the supernatural order, and specifically the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ and his mysteries, what we're talking about is accommodation, okay? We're talking about accommodation, a kind of accommodation in keeping with the tendency of the divine condescension. So what we have in our Lord's sacred humanity and the mysteries of his life is the most, almost fitting manifestation and communication of divine life for us, for us, while we were yet sinners. So the net effect of which is to facilitate recognition and reception in us who are addressed thereby. Okay, so this kind of sets us up. By treating efficiency first, we give teeth to our causal theory because it's the efficient cause which affects the change. All right, it's the efficient cause which supplies the motor. It's the, the efficient cause which brings it from this to that. But you'll never find efficient causality alone in the wild. You're never going to be able to corner it in such a way as to separate it from exemplar causality and final causality. They are always found together. They're always meant to be held together. So that's what we'll do. Uh, so when talking about exemplar causality, a simple image whereby to explain it is that exemplar causality is extrinsic formal causality. So the example that I cited earlier, we can flesh that out in greater detail. When an artist realizes a work of art in a medium, let's say that I'm an artist, I'm using a dry erase marker, marker to realize a work of art on this whiteboard. And, and in doing that, I have a notion of what it is that I intend to draw before impressing that notion in the medium. So I'm thinking the last coherent picture that I ever drew was in seventh grade art class, and it was an elephant, um, so I intend to draw an elephant, and I have that notion in my mind before I attempt to impress that notion on the medium, making a, a kind of intrinsic formal cause present therein. Um, so then, one further complexity to this theory is, what is it that I'm looking at, or what is it that I'm envisioning or imagining in order to bring about this change? So it, you can picture a landscape artist, uh, somebody sets up here on the Isis and is taking in the broad sweep of the river and it's in looking at the river that he or she formulates a notion and then impresses that notion in the medium. So there's a kind of exterior and then interior exemplar cause before the realization of the formal cause, if that makes sense. So when we talk about exemplar formal causality, we're talking in effect about the shape of the efficiency the pattern of the efficiency, the intelligibility of the efficiency. So we're just going to focus uh, on the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ and on his mysteries. What we're talking about is a manifestation and communication unto recognition and reception. God wants to manifest and communicate his divine life such that we recognize it and receive it and are changed thereby. And one way in which we can describe this, I don't know that it's the best way, but it's a way, is that God, you can picture God somewhat anthropomorphically as anguished as how best to communicate his divine life. There's this beautiful image in the story of a soul where St. Therese describes this from a certain perspective. She says, picture a father who is also a physician, all right? So he's a father, he's concerned, he's solicitous, he's bound up with the good of his kids, and he's also competent when it comes to the healing arts. Let's say that he sees his little daughter 
walking down the road before him, and he sees in her path a stumbling block. Now, he has options. He can either remove that stumbling block and prevent her from harming herself, and she'll toddle on down, no problem, for many minutes hence. The problem is she'll never really know that that stumbling block was removed, and she won't necessarily appreciate the care, the solicitude, the concern of her father. She might think that he doesn't care, when truth be, truth be told, he cares so much that he paves a way for her. Now, on the other hand, he says, she could also not remove, excuse me, he could also not remove the stumbling block and permit her to fall, which would be terrible, but on account of the fact that he's a physician gifted in the healing arts, he could then patch her up in such a way that she would know viscerally how much he loves her. But then she might revisit that event five, seven, 12 years later and realize that he could have removed the stumbling block, but he didn't. Does that represent a lack of love? So again, anthropomorphically, you can picture God somewhat anguished as how best to communicate his divine life, because that's what God wants to communicate. He wants to communicate his divine life. And so you can think about him, you know, in his divine essence with his various divine attributes and as it were expressed in his divine operations, thinking like, I want to give all of this to my creature. I want to give all of this to my sons and daughters. But what's the best way by which to go about it? How do I do it in such a way that he or she does not become presumptuous or despair filled, recognizing the care, the solicitude, the concern, but not second guessing that it could have been otherwise or that it could not have been? And so what we see as God's concrete answer to this question is Christ. In Christ, we see the divine care, concern, solicitude. We see the divine nature and attributes and operation pass through the prism of his sacred humanity. And what you see spelled out in a kind of visible spectrum of glory is the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is God's answer. That is how close he wants to be. That is how much he wants to manifest and communicate his saving love. So Christ's Grace and virtues are, as it were, the transposition of the divine nature and attributes, kind of making for us nearer, easier, and more human the life of God. Not because God needs it. He doesn't. Not because he wants to establish contact. He's already got it. But because we need it. And because it helps us to establish contact. Because it's communicated to us in an appearance, in a shape, according to a similitude, far closer as it were, or makes sensibler to our human lives. Because it's human. Because it's Christ. So then, the mysteries of the life of Christ effectively spell out, elaborate, and in doing so, accommodate salvation to us who are on the way. This is something not to be passed over. We as human beings live a life on the way. In the sense that our lives are progressive, discursive, unfolding, all these things. And it takes time. When St. Thomas describes like how to attain to beatitude, he says, well, how does God do it? He says, he is it. Moving on. He says, how do angels do it? He says, they do it by one movement. It's like, good, noted. Maybe in our case, it's two. No, he says, many movements. Our lives are characterized by many movements. That probably registers in most of our humanities as exhaustion, right? But it's not meant for exhaustion. It's meant for healing and growth. God gives us 70 years or 80 for those who are strong so that over the course of a life, we might be gradually matured unto the image of his divine son. And so Christ spells out the divine life across the whole of our human discursion, progression, unfolding, so that his whole life maps with its saving causality to the whole of ours. All right. So we can think here, and this is you know my fancy language, of both synchronic and diachronic accommodation. Synchronic at the same time, diachronic over time. So synchronic. Christ takes our human nature from top to bottom. All right. So he takes a human soul and a human body. He takes a human intellect and a human will and human passions and even the defects associated with human sin without himself incurring human sin. He takes our whole humanity, and here you think of the patristic dictum, what he has not assumed, he has not redeemed. In light of which fact, he says, I'll take it all. I'll fill my chalice with your whole human reality, and then I'll drain it to the dregs. That's my incarnate life, saith the Lord. 
So then, Christ, in addition to taking our humanity from top to bottom, he also takes it from start to finish. That is to say, he's conceived, and he gestates, and he's born, and he's presented in the temple, and he's lost to his parents at the age of 12. He lives a hidden life for some 18 years in relative obscurity. He bursts onto the scene in the public ministry. He preaches, he teaches, he tells parables, he exercises demons, he performs miracles, he suffers, he dies, he rises, he sits at the right of the Father, he reigns gloriously. Christ lives a whole human life from start to finish. So, synchronic accommodation, he shows a kind of vested interest in humanity. He establishes a graced solidarity and then diachronic accommodation. He establishes a temporal, or as it were, a discursive, progressive, unfolding solidarity. Christ has gone to the very limits of the earth. He's gone to the very limits of our nature so as to express that he will leave no stone unturned, that he will deploy no uh, or he will see fit to deploy all manner of means in the accommodation of our humanity unto salvation. So then we can just touch briefly on final causality uh, before concluding and then taking a little bit of time for questions. You can think about it in this way. What is salvation but deification? What is salvation but divinization? So it's not mere abolition of a debt. It's not mere imputation of, you know, a pleasant or agreeable status. It's the actual transformation of our interior nature such that our heart beats in time with that of God, such that we can become, says the Apostle Peter, partakers in his very nature, so that we can be, as the psalmist says, like gods and sons and daughters of the Most High. So, as Christians, we don't settle for being like nice or polite or kind or for following the rules well or for like getting along, as it were. We want to be like gods. All right, so whenever you see a Christian, he or she should have a kind of wild look in the eyes. Like, you know, I'll settle for nothing less. All right, I'll settle for nothing less. So what is salvation but deification? And what we see is that this is to be had or this is to be brought about by a kind of assimilation or conformity to God wrought in our very flesh, obviously in our soul, but wrought in our very flesh from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet, over the course of our life, such that we become conformed to him, all right? such that we become conformed to God in his being and in his operating. And what we see in the sacred humanity is a kind of germinal accomplishment of our deification. What we see in the mysteries is a kind of germinal accomplishment of our deification in its being and in its operating. Right? You have this patristic notion that the incarnation already answers, as it were, to the redemption. Our, our humanity has already shown itself susceptible to divinization in Christ. We have already given up the fight because he has already conquered in his own flesh. And yet he chooses to use that flesh as an instrument so as to extend the limits of that conquest to the very bounds of the world. And you see that in the missionary impulse of a St. Paul, right, who goes whether to Rome or to Spain or beyond, we know not, to the very edge of the world. Why? Because he wants to, like, tick off more converts so that he can outpace Peter? No, because it's the logic of divine life, that it wants to take hold of all of it, right? It wants to take hold of all of it. So the final cause, that is to say the point for which is salvation, that is to say deification or divinization, and in the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ and in his mysteries, we, we see that. We behold that. It's made manifest and communicable, not as a mere, you might prayerfully consider this as an option for your future proposal, but as a cause, as drawing us to it, as assimilating us unto the paradigm, as conforming us unto the Godhead through our Lord's sacred humanity and his mysteries. The way that this is ultimately mediated to us in the Christian community is by faith and sacrament. And St. Thomas has some beautiful passages in various works to this effect, that contact is established by faith, spiritually, by sacrament, corporeally. All right, that God gives us these things precisely so that we can lay hold of them. And so then we see this kind of mediation chain, as it were, or kind of a, a causal mediation wrought by many, um, yeah, go-betweens is the wrong word, but God 
takes to himself, you know, the sacred humanity, deploys these mysteries, establishes contact by faith and sacrament, sends us the ministers, right, and makes of us not mere recipients, but then in turn a kind of cause, because he wants us to be like him, not just in the receiving thereof, but actually in the manifesting and communicating thereof. So in the sacramental life, then, we can, like, reach back, that is to say, commemorate and represent the mysteries of the life of Christ so as to move forward in dispensing and applying them so as to ultimately see us through to the end. So then, final thought, we can return to the vantage of merit. What we see here is no mere payment. It's it's not a payment because the mysteries aren't a currency of exchange. That would seem to suggest that there's a third thing, right? As if there were money somehow introduced into the equation. There's no third thing. It's just us and God. And God intends to give us God. He intends to give us himself. So like when we talk about grace and virtues, gifts of the Holy Spirit, beatitudes, fruits of the Spirit, that is God's response to the next step. So he is already in his anthropomorphic anguish, given us Christ But he gives us Christ in a way that corresponds to our humanity and all of its nooks and crannies. He wants to get into the whole of ourselves by grace, each of our powers by virtue, even making us receptive to his promptings and their higher realizations, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God wants to get into every facet of our humanity so as to suffuse us with his divine life and bring about this transformation, which is salvation. So we're not talking about payment. All right, because the mysteries aren't a currency of exchange suggesting that there is some third thing. There's not some third thing. It's just God. God gives God. In his divine preordination, God wills that the whole life of Christ conduce to our salvation. He wills it as an ensemble, one that mounts over the course of a life to its height, to its climax in the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So while all of his deeds and sufferings save, yet these can be said to save with a certain excellence, with a certain power, with a certain beauty, because God wills it such. How do we know that? On the basis of revelation and our best efforts to make some sense of it. So we can see in the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ how much God loves us, how bad sin is, how dignified our nature is to be or called to be, and ultimately the destiny that awaits us in the union of our life to his God tells forth his love in most excellent fashion at the climax of salvation precisely so as to draw us, not merely to propose, to offer a model, or simply say, it's at your whim, but as a cause thereof, turning us to him, drawing us into his life. So if mere payment, then he is a prodigal fool. But if the outpouring of love, then the mysteries are beautifully suited to tell forth the divine abundance. Thank you.